Welcome to the We Are One podcast. Today we're talking about Tom Campbell, his IMAX speech, and I need 35 more subs to get monetized. Hit that subscribe button, guys, and share. Thank you. Let's go. Welcome back to the We Are One podcast. It's been a long time. I apologize. I got plenty for you. The question is, how much time do I have? And uh, how much time will you spare uh, us with your, your spirit? So for that, I appreciate it. This episode is going to get right into it. Uh, A lot of things to talk about, but this one's going to primarily be upon the IMEC IMEC convention that just passed on September the 2nd. Our good friend Chris Anatra, our good friend Cynthia Sue Larson, and there's two other members of the IMEC conference. So I'll be referencing this. I chopped it up a little bit. Uh, Plenty to talk about, plenty to discuss. And uh, Chad, do you have anything else you want to say before we hit this play button? Yeah, I just want to say that I interviewed Cynthia Sue Larson a few years back. She's wonderful to have on the channel. I would love to have her back on. And I've interviewed uh, Chris Anatra probably 16 times. 17, 24. Yeah, a lot of times. But uh, And Chris has become as good a friend as you can have remotely. And um, he's just one of the the good people in this world. Agreed, agreed. Cynthia is one of my favorites also. She's awesome. I had her on. Probably try to get both of them back on eventually. Uh, Chris, if you watch this, you got the notification bell. I texted you a week ago, dude. You didn't respond. So I'm calling you out live on the air for all like 110 viewers that are going to watch this on my channel. And Chad's like 2,000 viewers on Ben the Spoon. And then another 5,000 or so on Open Your Reality. So without further ado, uh, I'm excited to get on this conversation with Tom Campbell and talking about it with Tom's biggest fan, Mr. Chad. Yeah, let me set the stage. So this IMEC conference is held once a year, I believe. It's uh, in Connecticut where Chris lives. And uh, Tom Campbell, who is the founder of MBT, my big theory of everything. And Tom Campbell, I look at him as like a spiritual mentor. Like I said, I've had him on the show three times before. I'd love to have him back on again. And uh, Tom talks a lot about how this reality is constructed. He basically believes that it's a simulation, which I think we're both in agreement with. And so Tom couldn't make it to the conference, so it was remote. Um, And I I didn't see the whole thing. I was watching parts of it. And here's the thing that people should know is that Tom Campbell is not a believer in the Mandela effect. So then why is he at the conference? Good good, good points. Good points. And if you stick around to the end, you're going to hear me uh, question some of Tom's, uh, uh, the nature of Tom's reality, because scientists and simulationists Wow, that it just it's gonna get interesting. It's gonna get interesting. But but Ken, do you know why Tom is speaking at the International Mandela Effect Conference when he doesn't believe in Mandela effects? No, we're gonna find out. Okay. We're gonna find tape. out. Play that tape. I'm gonna roll this beautiful bean footage. <laughs> check, check, check one, check two. The Mandela effect has an assortment of probable causes. There is not just one cause. And I'm going to give you four ways that the nature of consciousness and reality causes the Mandela effect. This is the first one. We each live in our own reality. There is not just one reality for everyone. How we interpret the data stream we receive from the virtual reality server creates our personal reality. Okay. Now, if you take in that fact, then you should understand that beliefs and attitudes, experience and understanding, fear, needs, and expectations modify both our personal reality and our memory of our reality, okay? So each of us lives in our own reality. That reality is how we interpret the information we get. Remember, I said, this is a virtual reality. You are a piece of consciousness. You are playing a human avatar. That means you make all the choices for your avatar. By those choices, if those choices are good choices, those choices lower entropy for yourself in the system, then you evolve. Can you stop for one sec? I I got to tell you, 
doesn't he look like the architect from the Matrix? From, the Matrix. Movie, from, from this perspective right here, very much. Yep, he does. He does. What What are your thoughts about what he just said about um, living in our, each of our own realities? Do you have any comments on that? Any thoughts? Yeah, I believe this is a multiplayer game, but each of us has our own perspective of the game. And it, it really depends how far you want to go with it. Because you could use your mind's like a, a is almost like an interface computer. And the software is whatever, whatever you, you focus on. And so your world, like my world right now, I've got a landscaper outside. Sorry if you hear that. But, but you can really focus down deeply into anything. And, and that becomes your world. You could be fully immersed in sports. It could be chess. It could be going out of body. And so you kind of create your reality in that sense. Everything that you feel and believe, you're really creating it because you're making the decision. And that's what I believe he means. But ultimately, everyone is in the same simulation, the multiplayer game. Hold that thought. You help evolve yourself. And as you evolve, the larger system evolves because you're just a part of this larger system. Yes, we are all one. We're all part. We are one. Is that what he said? We are all one. Wow. Thanks. Time for the plug. Of this larger system. Next. Therefore, since beliefs and attitudes, experience, you know, fear, needs, expectations modify both our reality and our memory of reality, it's kind of easy to see how that, you know, uh, affect the uh, Mandela effect. Therefore, those with similar cultures and attitudes will have more similar realities. All right. What is real? That's part of your, your uh, uh, question here. One of your fundamental questions is what is real? Consciousness is fundamental and real. Other than that, only information is real. Nothing is more real than information. I think he's going to contradict himself in a little bit. He said, and I want you to remember this, information is real. Well, but what information is real? Well, you know, I've been watching Tom a long time and he says consciousness is the only fundamental thing in all of existence. And we are consciousness. But then he does say that we are digital information systems. And we're so, different consciousnesses is what he's saying, individual units. So if there's different information coming in and I'm interpreting it one way and you're interpreting another way, that's called what? That's that's a subjective, that's a subjective reality, but there is an objective reality. So he just said the information is, is, is real, but my information and your information can be two different things. Correct. And that's where it gets tricky. Correct. Yeah. And, and he is always real. that. The information is always real for the consciousness that's interpreting it or receiving it. It's only, but, but here's my point. It's only real to have it interpreted by you my real is not your real so Correct. therefore what information is real that's th this is this is a science question because the observer effect and a scientist trying to replicate an experiment the information is not real the information is interpreted the only thing that is real is the way that you feel the way that you experience the way that you uh, react that's real the experience is real and let me let me, let me push this over to your last, one of your best interviews, your Darius J. Wright interview. Mm -hmm. Darius says, what are we here for? And I 100% agree. We are here to experience. And let's go back. What are we experiencing? We are experiencing the information that Tom says is objective, but it's not. It is subjective. And we are experiencing that through our avatars, through our spirit. And that is what's real. The information is not real. The way we interpret it is real. Well, I, I beg to differ a little bit. I do think the information is real in a certain sense. For example, uh, everybody that's watching this right now could agree that I'm wearing a gray cap, right? That may unless not you're colorblind. Color, unless they're colorblind, right? But 99.9% .9 are going to see gray, gray, and this is black. But the information... It, like you said, the information is interpreted in different ways. You talked about the Darius Wright interview. When Darius went out of body, he saw a construct of what the earth is. And he described it in our 
interview. If Tom goes out of body or Robert Monroe or anybody else, they may not see that same construct. They may exactly. Not so, what, so what is the information? Is my that, that's my point. The information that we interpret is, is what's real. It's only real to us. It's not real to everyone. It's not. It's not an objective truth. But our data streams are probably given different information, right? Because. Darius is seeing something completely different from what Tom sees, from what Robert Monroe and what other people see. So everybody can be given a different data stream once the information becomes more subjective, going within, being, being a conscious explorer. But in the objective everyday world, we're basically seeing the same thing. So dreams, hallucinations, out-of-body experiences, these things become very, very subjective. Yep. Agre agreed. And I would make a comment that I think that consciousness is not fundamental. I think there's a larger system in play that is that is um, letting all of us have our consciousness subjectively. So if information was real and it was one piece of information that most people who, who were walking around among us, maybe not the viewers that are watching this, but most people would say that this world is extremely objective or, or sorry, uh, subjective. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's a hard line. This is blue. That's a wall. Uh, that's white. This is pink. The sky is blue. It, it's very, it's very cut and dry. But what I'm saying is, and what Tom is saying is that if we're all individual avatars, deciphering information, then, then something's above those streams of consciousness. It's filtering everything out. And, you know, so th th that's as deep as I can get is that there's something deeper than consciousness, something above, I guess is the best way to put it. Something is above consciousness. It's the program that of which we are able to use our spirit to infer through our bodies and our avatars um, into this reality or, or what we perceive as reality. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get it. I get it. That's a, that's a bigger argument, but we'll get back to the clip. Yep, let's get back. Reality equals information. All right, next. This is the second. So that's the first way that um, the Mandela effect, uh, you know, is uh, comes into being is that uh, we don't share a single reality. And our the reality that we get is modified. And our memory of it is modified by our beliefs and attitudes. There are I want to make one more point real quick. If everything is an obser observer effect and everything is is seen through multiple vantage points, then how can you be a scientist? How well, can you, there, how there can you are, repeat an experiment? How can you get the same data points? There are experiments that are done by scientists around the world and they get different results. They so, should all be different results based on what we're talking about. Most. Are literally millions of people and we all know many of them that have a name that ends in stein here we go y'all some pronounce it Stein. to make some people upset epstein goldstein you know lots of lots of names you can probably think of 10 of them right off the top of your head now when you see a name that ends in stain all that's happened is that that E in Stein is replaced by an A. You will see that when you pattern match that, you will see that stain at the end of that name and it will come right out into your reality as a Stein. Collective consciousness is the vector sum of all the individual consciousness that represent members of a particular group. Here's a common example of a collective consciousness. It's that we call a mob. A mob is a bunch of angry people. Now that mob will do things that are much worse than any one of the members of that mob would ever do by themselves. Why is that? A mob is a bunch of angry people and that collective consciousness, all that anger then feeds back and makes them more angry. In other words, I, I gotta stop. I gotta stop you, Tom. What are you talking about, sir? Are you saying that a mob group who gets upset and infuriated and, and energized is actually that's what collective consciousness is? 
No, that's not what collective consciousness is. Chad, what what do you think? I mean, I agree. I definitely agree with him that a mob is definitely worse than what an individual would typically do. But that's not. But that's not the term for collective consciousness. Collective consciousness means everybody. <clears throat> Collective consciousness means he's using he's using that as a metaphor. That, that, that's the bad metaphor, man. I'm sorry. That that's horrible. That's horrible. I mean, I, I'm not trying to pick at him. I'm just saying, the mob mentality is not a consciousness. That is not that is not that is not an example for that. And um, you know, going back to the the Berenstein Berenstein, he said it's pattern recognition. Your thoughts on on if the Berenstein Bears was pattern recognition and a misremembering by everyone else. No, of course not. I don't even know where he gets that from. I understand pattern recognition. Also, I'd like to see the experiment on that. That that you know he he's going to reference or he I mean may not have got the clip, but he's going to reference uh, reading paragraphs um, and being able to read them even though some of the letters are misspelled or or at uh, um, you know asterisks or whatever through the paragraph. But you can your brain can pattern recognize. But that's not what the Mandela effect is. That has nothing to do with the Mandela effect. That's that is pattern recognition, but it's it's not a misremembering. And if you see those paragraphs, you're not going to look at a paragraph, the whole paragraph, and say, "Oh, it looks fine to me." And in his example, he says that people didn't even know that that, that the words were all misspelled and jumbled up and stuff. I, that's 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 hocus pocus. Yeah, but it's not. And the Mandela effect is not just words. We're talking about logos, or we're talking yep. about body. Like I've, I've had a last time I had Chris on the show a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about how the kidneys and the liver have changed position, even yep. the heart. It's constantly changing. So it's all these things. It's geography. It's not just words. Right. C yeah. We're, he's going to get into a little more into that. And I'm going to give him a chance to speak. And, and honestly, I've listened to it a few times. He's got some good points, but we'll just continue to play and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. You're one of 10 people in a mob, then the other nine people. Their anger makes your anger grow. That's not you consciousness. That that's energy. Consciousness. And it works the other way around. If you are around a bunch of highly evolved, very grown up, selfless, nice people, very positive people, it will help pull you up. If you hang out with people like that, you'll just feel lighter and better. He's misterming it. That's not a term. Them. Collective consciousness affects you. If you work for... IBM, then there's a certain dress codes you wear. Nobody tells you you have to wear a That's white shirt. It's called culture. And, you know, I Not consciousness. hear a lot of strange stories, and I tend to investigate them and make sure that that uh, you know they're they're honest and and not somebody making things up or a bad dream or something like that. But I know of incidents where. Uh, a young lady was driving her car. Here we go. This is a good one. The day. She was not tired. She did not do drugs. Uh, you know, it was, she was wide awake, knew exactly where she was doing, where she was going. She was paying attention to her driving. She was on a four lane highway and an older couple in a large car just drifted right out in front of her from a side street. She braced herself for the crash and a big flash of light occurred. She found herself on the other side of the intersection on the side of the street, looked in the rear view mirror, and there that old couple in that car was just pulling into the other lane and, and uh, continuing on their way like nothing happened. So if that happened to you, how would you feel about this whole situation, your whole reality, your whole misremembering, the collective consciousness and culture that he's describing? I mean, what he just described with the car incident has nothing. I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think it's it, he's talking about more of like a supernatural experience. Quantum. That's called quantum immortality. Quantum it, immortality it, it, but it is is what he's referring to. Yes, I, I think. But, he, but what, he, but what he's saying is that that reality is bending. Reality's bending. The observer effect. If, if the question is, did anybody observe that to happen? And then what were their thoughts about it? Did they even see it, or did they not really pay attention? Maybe she was the only one in that situation, so she was able to bend that situation um, um, to, to not. Right. Not that, Tom does say, like, if 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 there's nobody watching, then then the the larger consciousness system can do things like that. And I've I've heard stories like that, and I've watched I've seen videos. There's a really good video on YouTube of like very close 
calls. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. And there's even one where there is a, uh, there was a man, I believe he was walking a cart. It looked like it was in a third world Asian country. He's walking a cart across the street and this truck and glitched. Came. Yeah. The truck came and it shows when you slow it down into slow motion, we don't know if this is actually true or not, but it looked like an angelic being came, grabbed the man and pushed him over to the side of the road, almost yeah, like I in a it. matrix movie. But nobody, but, but nobody may have seen it live, but the camera caught it. The camera so, caught it. I mean, the system, the system glitched, the system corrected itself. But like, I mean, so what, what I'm saying is he's, he's basically, not, he's not saying anything about memory right now or culture or those kind of things. He's saying reality has shifted or shifted for this young lady because he believes her. So, I mean, I don't know if he really believes her or he just, he believes her, you know, on, on face value. But so, so something like this has happened and it happened to me too with the alligator incident playing golf. And, you know, I was like, how did that just happen? But again, reality is shifting. And this scientist, Tom, and I respect him. I think he's a really smart guy. I'm, I'm not knocking him. I'm just, I'm questioning his, his self, um, his self assessment of, of, of his situation. Like this, if I'm a scientist and this happens to me or th that I believe this happens and we'll, we'll see his incident in a second, it changes my life. I'm no longer a scientist because I can no longer verify individual experiments, um, you know, the, the way that I'm supposed to by a scientific method. It changes my entire life. And it did change my life this way. So I'll, I'll keep playing it, but this has got me fired up. I've heard dozens of stories like that. The reason I hear them is people come up to me and say things like, I've never shared this with anybody because people would think I was crazy, all right? I was there to think I'm crazy. I don't care doing this and what I was going to say. So the system gave me a little bump in my reality just so I'd have a first hand story. And now he plugs your channel. This is incredible. Is he going to say Ben the Spoon too? Oh, wait a minute. You saying he he talks about open your reality? Here? He just said he just said it opened his reality. Oh, about, uh, okay, doing this okay. and what I was going to say. So the system gave me a little. Won't be in my reality, just so I'd have Look a that. story to tell. A little open and, my reality. Uh, it would. Uh, Thank you, Tom. Wasn't a big deal. It wasn't. He loves you, man. Thing, he loved you. But what happened was that uh, about, about four months. Ago, Tom, if you love me, man, come back. Come back to me. Come on the show. I hope he doesn't watch this. He'll be like that guy <laughs> you were talking to. He's ripped me. No, I, I. He understands. I think. I mean, I just. I'd like him to go a little further. With, no, with I, his think, I think it's logic. okay to respectfully disagree with what anyone says. If you have your own opinions, we all do. That's my own reality, right? Mm -hmm. No. It's open. Uh, we cleaned up our cupboards, and when we did, we found out that we had all kinds of things. There you go. Here's his bought, personal you know, story. We had it, bought another one, you know, that sort of thing. So we cleaned up a, a, our closet, like the uh, closet that had all our pharmaceuticals in it like uh, nasal sprays and that kind of stuff and we found out we had like five bottles of nasal spray you know all of them partly used and <laughs> you know how that is you clean up a cupboard and you find things like that so i was going through them and i noticed this one which was old and didn't have much in it and it was called four-way so i looked at it i looked at the ingredients and indeed it had four ingredients in it and i wondered if any of those ingredients were the the kind that you can get addicted to, you know, that if you use it too long, then your nose is always stuffy unless you use it. So I wonder if uh, turmeric was one of those ingredients. Just figure I throw it out there. I, 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 I doubt it. <laughs> it. It definitely wasn't, the, but that's what happened life. to me and you, right? And Same thing. Looked on all the other bottles to see whether the ingredients of those, those four ingredients were also found in the other, in the other bottles that we had of nasal spray, different, all of them, different brands. And three of them were, and one of them was unique. So that was interesting. I, we just like to keep track of things like that, because if you think you're only getting so much of a particular ingredient, but you're trying different products, then it, you need to know whether the same ingredients are in different products so you don't think you're, you get too much of it. So anyhow, we did that. And... About four months later, my nose was stuffy again, and I got this thing out, but I couldn't remember whether it had good or bad ingredients, you know, whether the whether ingredients were good or bad. So again, 
my wife's lying in the bed and I call out these ingredients to her. And I'm, of course, I'm not saying them so much as I'm spelling them because I can't pronounce most of those, you know, <laughs> chemical names that have like 15 letters in them. Uh, so I'm spelling them out to her. Well, finally, I used up every, all of the nasal spray that was in that little bottle that said four-way. So I said, Pamela, let's get another bottle of that. That worked very well. So she did. We took the old bottle, set it down next to her computer so she could look at it. We, we buy everything online. We don't go to stores anymore. We just do things on the computer. So I had this sitting next to her computer and she saw it and she went out and found it and bought it. And we, a couple of days later, it shows up at the house and I look at it and I look at the ingredients. There's only one ingredient in it. And I go, oh, no, we got the wrong version of it. You know, we didn't get the right one. So I, you know, go over and, and the old bottle still sitting there, you know, it was old and had some stains on it and whatever. And was I it a stain or a stain? Bottle up and looked at it. Ah, good one. And it had just one ingredient. <laughs> just one ingredient. That's all. And I thought, that's all. That's all, Tom. So your reality just changed, and that's your expression. He's like the the Neil Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin coming back from the moon. We went to the moon. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, for someone like Tom, I'm really surprised that this is the first Mandela effect that he's experienced. And it was a personal one, and that's what changed his mind, these nasal sprays. You know, Chris had informed me about that before I even watched this video. Right. Yep. So I'll keep playing it. But that's impossible. I've read these off. Pamela and I, you know, I, I couldn't have, you know, I couldn't have made all those names up in my mind if I had wanted to. So how did that happen? Well, you know, that's the way this works. The system can add and subtract data and change your reality. That's what's going on in all those examples. Tom, can you hear me? All those examples. So I'm interested because it's only been a few months since he said this happened to him. And actually, he he mentioned that this happened to him um, along the same time that he agreed to do this, this Mandela Effect speaker. So so again, he's he's opening his reality, another plug for you, but he's now seeing these things happen or or noticing them happening because he's open to the possibility or he's looking for a sign or whatever you might want to say it is. But, uh, you know, hopefully in the next few months, he's a little less scientific and a little more open to uh, what's going on. Maybe it'll give him some self-discovery like I'm asking him for. I, I, one of the reasons I was drawn to Tom is because he's a mix of science and he's a mix of spirituality. He worked for NASA. He definitely has a left brain perspective, but he also goes out of body all the time and has been meditating his whole life. And so I think he's bridging the best of both, but there, there have been some things about Tom that I disagree with. And the Mandela effect was a big one, but I'm really glad to see him coming around now. Yeah. I, I, I think there are three parts to, to being, um, a good searcher or a good person looking for answers. And I think he's missing the intuitive part of it. Um, I, I, I think that he, he's seen certain things in his life that, that make him be a little more spiritual. He's processed them that way, but it's, it's almost like it's a box. He just checked the spiritual box because he couldn't explain it, you know, with science. And um, I, I hope that he's, he's going a little more internal to, to find out what, what, you know, more of where this is coming from, as opposed to just checking the box of unknown. Cause I think that there's a lot more for him to talk about in the future. Right. By the way, we had, I have like landscapers going on, uh, thunder. I don't know. I can't hear anything. You're Great. good. Great. You, okay. There's nothing. All right. I think people would say something. There's nobody in the chat. Just, just kidding. Uh, but, uh, th there's nothing I can, you're good. Well, that's, so only that's your data stream play. in my data stream. I'm seeing hundreds of people. Well, yours is not the truth. Mine is. <laughs> I do. Excellent. Thank you for that. Great. Interest. This is a good question. So hey, this guy's on my way, wavelength. So, hey, Cynthia, how are you? A phenomenon is something that is essentially unexplainable. And so when we are trying to explain this Mandela effect to people, I call them the unconvinced. Um, 
they work overtime to try to put what to us is a phenomenon into this naturalistic box. Well, I can clear this up, John. You know, it's just misremembering. So they're suggesting that this is just the normal course of everyday events in human history, that misremembering is always been happening. And this is very frustrating because although um, we may not know exactly what it is we're experiencing, we know what it isn't. It isn't misremembered. Okay, I meet Joe at Hallelujah. the Christmas party. Preach. And I say, hey, Joe. And he says, oh, no, my name is John or Jim. And I, and I, I say, that's misremembering. But uh, what we're experiencing is very different than that. So uh, exactly. work, your work is amazing. And uh, your attempt to quantify and explain this phenomenon, so it essentially is no longer a phenomenon, is very appreciated. Um, but my question is, I'm a little confused me too. Uh, by your section called uh, what, What's the Cause of the Mandela Effect? So, item number two, you spoke about memory matching, and item number three, the collective consciousness, which to me sounded just like the unconvinced. They're trying to say, Oh, you're just misremembering, you're just confusing the platter's peanut guy with the Monopoly guy. And we're like, No, no, it's not that. <laughs> so, uh, what I'm asking for is just a little clarification. Um, because my observation is that this type of experience has never happened in recorded history before. All of my life, I think it these has. things weren't in my Bible. You, you think it's happened in, in the past, Chad? I, I mean, I, I talked with Chris about this a number of times. Um, according to him, Mandela effects have been going on probably since the dawn of time. And have they, in one sense, in our reality, they have, but in another sense, maybe not. Because there could be that there was a point that they were put into our reality. And it's the what do you call that when it when it when you look back in time and it's always been the same retro causality. Mm -hmm. So in retro causality, if so if something new was put into the timeline, let's say the Mandela effect was put in, let's say in I don't know, 2012. And even though there, there have been people that have recognized it earlier than that, but if it was the year 2012 then we can we could kind of say hey i don't remember any mandela effects before 2012 so it must have been 2012 when they started but in our new timeline those mandela effects have been happening all the way back to the dawn of time so you can look at it both ways it started in 2012 i'm not saying it's 2012 but it started at, at a particular point but it was also present throughout all of history that's what's so yeah, confusing I about it yeah, I, I think I think the, the the dawn of the information age, the the internet, the uh, Bluetooth, wireless, uh, cell phones, worldwide communication has has really shined the light on it because I don't I don't think it's something that people would have taken seriously. Uh, and again, the narrative is that we're misremembering, but I mean th there are probably many times in my life offhand I can't think of one time in particular for a specific example that I was like, that's not true, but. Uh, I know like in my family circle, I remember things a certain way specifically. My memory is really, really good um, and, and accurate. Um, and when 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 a family member would say, that's not the way it happened, I would say, oh, I can give you the entire context of the situation and it makes sense to me 100%. And they're like, no, I don't remember it that way. So like, it's hard to prove. Um, but when you have when you have photos of people at parties with the the, the monocle of the Monopoly man, um, and you have um, these examples, um, then they're changed. It really puts more in the context. The residue really amplifies the situation and it makes things go a little more uh, substantiated. Well, let me say something about it. I had like when I had Chris on the show a couple of weeks ago, he talked about ten new Mandela effects. One of them was the Raven and the Dove. From the yep. Bible story, was it Noah, Noah's Ark? When Noah sent forth, it was two, supposed to be two doves, and I think now it's a raven and a dove. Mm -hmm. So there have been some big changes, but a lot of people, you ask the average person on the street, they're not aware of these changes. They're not aware of them, right? And that's the thing. If you go to your regular person, somebody in your family who's not spiritual, who doesn't follow any of this, and you show them a very stark example of the Mandela. By the way, can you hear the, that landscaping in the back? I, it's a very, very low hum. I can barely hear it. Okay, because for You're some good. reason, 
as soon as we started this interview, they came right out. And that's usually, that's typically how it goes for me. Like okay, as soon as I start the video, they come right. Tom, <laughs> anyway, that's the larger consciousness system trying to, trying to mess you up, but. Uh... Oh, believe me, it does. But I'm trying to overcome it with my consciousness right now. Jedi powers make those things go away. <laughs> so um, what was I talking about, Ken? Uh, you were talking about uh, the Mandela effect. I know I was. I'm just playing. I was making. Um, a, I, I had a very specific point to make. You. I'm just, you I just have these landscapers buzzing in it, my heads the whole time. Can we? Can we wrap it up soon? Because it's just so annoying to me. Yep. There's only a few. Uh, about two minutes left of the video. Uh, but let's go. Oh, I'm but I was going to say this. I, I remembered my point. <sighs> so. So anyway, I hope you guys at home can't hear that, but it's super loud. Nothing. Okay. So if you go to a family member who is not spiritual and you point out some of these very obvious Mandela effects, see what their reaction is because they may act like an NPC. First, they might say, this is always surprising. They may say, oh, it's always been that way. And you're like, wait a minute. The Scarecrow always carried a gun in the Wizard of Oz? Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I know we, we I never. They'll, they'll just say, I never noticed that. I, that's, that's, that's weird. Right. So anyway, you can play the videotape. Yep. It's hard to convince people for sure. Um, and, 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 and again, I have a whole, I'm going to do a whole monologue probably after this and I'll post it probably tomorrow morning after I post this today, because I, you know, it, it really goes into the, um, the thought process of solipsism and, and doing a, a circle for me about that, because this is how I got to that level. I was like, we had a conversation about something. And then two years later, you're saying we never had a conversation. Like, What's in there? Who's in there? Is anybody in there? Like that's that's the thought mentality that I've gone through on my spiritual journey, trying to figure this out. Because, like this guy, he's asking questions to a guy who's supposed to be uh, open-minded, and then I, I don't think he's got it. And I'm like, how do you how do you get it? But you have no idea. Like, why would you group misremembering and 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 brain? You know, uh, the way the pattern recognition works into the Mandela effect. We're talking about physical things that have changed. Well, I'm saying, why, why even bring Tom to this conference? You know, he's not the, he just found out this yep. personal Mandela effect with the nasal spray. He's not a big believer right. in it. Yep. Yep. You know, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. And maybe they were looking to be disproven, uh, you know, or, or see what his topic was. And, and maybe that was their job to, to bring him into this conference, to open his, open his reality up to there's potentially more. They wanted him to explore it. It's hard to make somebody look, you know, sit down and, and do research on a topic where they don't want to do it or they don't believe it. Sometimes it, it takes that. You can't you can't force anybody to learn. You yeah, know, I, I, to I agree, and I don't think Tom I don't think Tom really gets it as far as what what we're talking about. Even though he understands the concept, like that that nasal spray thing, it sent me and you both into the the, the turmeric turmeric state of what the hell is going on over here. Yeah, just for those people that don't know, um, my first Mandela effect, or at least personal one, was turmeric. It used to be. T-U-M-E-R-I-C. That's how it was spelled always. And I used to take turmeric all the time because I had the bottles. I and I'm 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 kind of like a a stickler for for words and I'm always looking at the words. So then one day it was turmeric with the extra R, T-U-R-M-E-R-I-C. And I, I was like, did they just did they just change the name? Maybe they changed the name, the brand. Then I saw, no, no, no. Turmeric, the word changed. And then I, I looked at the bottles, they changed to crazy i'm like how do the bottles change in my refrigerator somebody's some little elf machine elf went in there and put an extra r that's the mandela effect for it, you it makes you question stuff i had a youtuber that i was following he's still millions of viewers and i i, I heard him talk about turmeric all the time and i went back through like you and i was like what 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 the hell is this like how did that how did there's no way i missed that so i go back and watch a video and he's like turmeric and i'm like what this dude just changed what he just said and, I, and it makes you question things. Um, but again, it wakes, it does wake you up and, and it makes you more observant in your everyday life to go, you know, I, I'm, I'm time stamping stuff now, man. I'm, you know, the stuff that happens to me, I, I'm time stamping it and it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I'm putting it in my memory bank that I'm like, you know, I know for sure I'm writing it down and I'm doing these things to, to remember correctly uh, and, and have documentation and have residue or whatever. Um, of the way that I'm actually experiencing this, but goes back to my topic of 
the only thing real is the experience. Um, you know, and that's all I can prove to myself. You know, mirror, mirror on the wall, all this event is a new experience. So how how do you frame this um, in, in terms of, you know, we're experiencing what is a new phenomenon. So is it the Schumann residence? I mean, what's essentially introduced this experience to humanity? What is it that we're experiencing? So it's the ready from those that are not ready. And you're never going to convince the people that are not ready. They're not able to stretch their mind that far to come to that conclusion that conflicts with what they know to be true, which is materialism. They know that that's true. And when we pattern match, we, we come to conclusions. We see things that become part of our reality and there are facts. I saw that. That's what it said. You know, nobody thinks that they have a belief. Everybody sees their belief as a fact. That's just. No, no, I don't. The nature of belief. No, I so don't. If you believe something, well, I believe that this is true. Then that is a fact to you. You believe that it's true. It's a fact. So you see, nobody believes they have a belief. Everybody thinks they just have the facts. That's where I stopped it because I think of the things that he's saying, I disagree the most with that statement. I don't know a damn thing. I don't know anything. I've seen it. I, I think I've seen it all, but then I know there's no way that I've seen it all. I'm not tied to any belief. I know you get a lot of flack from, from some of your, your, your haters and distractors because you're not tied to anything. Do you think that simulation is a fact for you? Um, no, I, I don't think it's a fact. What's a um, fact? What's a fact in your life? I think you're the same. I think you're very similar to me that we don't think anything is a fact. No, the only fact I would is what it, I guess the strongest belief that you can have is anything that happens in your personal life. So, you know, I know that I live in an apartment. You know, um, I know that I have a YouTube channel, you know, things like that. That's not a belief, though. What is it? He's, he's saying, no, I'm saying that's not a belief. He's saying that everyone believes what they believe is a fact. I'm, I'm thinking no, he says not, whatever you believe strongly is your fact. That's, that's not I'm what thinking. he said. That's not what he said. He he said no one believes what the, no one believes that their belief system is not is that everyone believes their belief system is a fact. Meaning, it's not Christians believe that it's a fact. No, uh, you, you know people who are seeking the truth, or you know that are that are out there trying to find things day in and day out, trying to be aware trying to be uh, observant and, and be open. You can't be open and think that what you have is, is it. I agree with that. I, I, I still harbor a, a deep desire that there is some type of objective truth out there, whether it's Tom's MBT or it's the law of one. But would you theory. say that's a fact? Would you say objective? there's an objective reality that is a fact? No, there is no objective reality that's a fact. But what I mean, but what I mean, some I harbor some desire that there's a truth, meaning that there is a path that we can follow to ascension in a sense. There's, for instance, Tom always talks about shedding our fear and becoming love, and that's the way we evolve and reduce mm -hmm. the entropy of the system and raise our vibration. I, I I wish it was that easy, that all we have to do is that and we can ascend. But I do think there's more variables to it. And I've interviewed a lot of people and obviously a, a guy like Darius is going to defer a little bit from someone like Tom and no two people ever seem to have the same system, belief system or thought system or theory about what this reality is. So we have to kind of take that upon ourselves to decide, is this true? Is that true? Now, some people, like I said before, they have these subjective experiences where they have dreams, hallucinations, they go out of body. I had Peter from the 434 channel on. And Peter does this through psychedelics. And he met machine elves who he believes is giving him all the correct information about our reality. Like that's his implicit belief that it's fact for him. Mm -hmm. And we listen to it and he sounds very confident and the information that he gives sounds credible, but ultimately still we have to decide for ourselves. Now, people like me, I generally don't have out of body experiences. I don't have them at all. 
I don't have hallucinations. I don't take psychedelics. I do have these wonderful dreams, but most of the time it's just me. It's just me existing in, inside some type of experience. I don't know if it's necessarily a teaching or learning experience. Like I'm being shown the universe mm -hmm. like Darius did with Celeste. So what's for me to believe? Well, that makes me more of an intellectual. I have to use my left brain a little bit more to decide. But even if I did anchor my thoughts onto a theory like Tom's MBT, which I have for the most part, that doesn't mean that's what I'm going to experience when I die or go out of body. So it is a little frightening in that regard because you can't really hang your hat on anything in this system anymore. And I think he says that. I, I don't think I, I would find a fault with what he just said if he would have just replaced the word fact with truth, because you, you believe your, 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 your beliefs, your belief system, you, you, you think that they are true. You, if you think that they're a fact, what are you still here for? I mean, really, if you found everything stop watching anything that you learn anything, cause you know it all. I, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, there are religious people, there are Catholics and Christians and Buddhists that, they implicitly believe in their faith. They're probably not watching this. But there are people, a lot of spiritual people, who do kind of believe in a faith, but they still watch this because they they don't believe in it as implicitly as perhaps a Christian or a Catholic who's been devout sure. their whole life. And I've been there too. I read I read Neil Donald Walsh's work, who I've had on the show as well, Conversations with God, and I thought, you know, that's it. Then it was Tom Campbell, or his Law of One, or David Wilcox. But you never, but you never stop searching. Is, is that's kind of where I'm going with this? Like you, you, you have an insatiable um, quest for knowledge. And my point is, if you if you believe you know it all, there's 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 no insatiable quest uh, thirst for knowledge. And and that's what I have an issue with it is that he's saying everyone thinks that their beliefs are fact. And I don't think that that's it at all. I don't think that's even close to the, as smart as he is to make that statement to me is, is, is horror. It, it's just completely misrepresenting, you know, what we're doing here, what we're talking about here. Well, one of the, one of the things I look at is not just someone's system like Tom Campbell's MBT, but I look at the near death experience accounts of regular people. And I listen to them on a fairly regular basis here on YouTube. There's some mm -hmm. channels that, only talk about NDEs. Uh, so when I listen to those stories, they all have a, a similar a similar story in terms of uh, the person, usually when they go out of body, there was a traumatic experience or a quick sudden accident. And as soon as they go out of body, all that disappears. They're enveloped by love and light. They're spoken to by an angelic being. They're given answers to you know, all the answers, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? Where am I supposed to go? And they're sometimes given a choice whether to go back or not. Sometimes they're forced back. So I look more at those accounts because I believe they're very believable. It's just a person giving their account. Now, there are people who give accounts of going to hell, but I think that their beliefs have colored their experience. But I primarily listen to the ones that talk of going more to an angelic heaven. And I think for all of us, if we're just good people, we're, we're probably going to, that's probably what we're going to experience. So it may not matter what you believe, whether you believe MBT, the law of one, Course in Miracles, whatever it is, you're probably going to experience only something good when you die. If, if, you're, if your vibration is like the law of one says, over 51% good, if you're mostly a good person. I think those people who experience something bad either were were people that made a lot of bad choices in life or they really bought into the whole hell theory. And that's what they experience. And you know, most of those people who go to hell when they're there, they said it feels like an eternity, but as soon as they start thinking of Jesus, there's a Jesus figure that comes and takes them out. So what does that tell you? They have control. We have more control than we think. More power. A hundred, hundred percent. And I want to give a quick, quick plug to, uh, um, the archaics channel and bro Sanchez. I heard them talking. I don't know if you know who that guy is, bro mm -hmm. Sanchez. Mm -hmm. So he, he and Jason had a conversation. I don't know if a few months ago, it's a great conversation. It was a great dialogue and basically um, echoes my thoughts. I've said it before. I think I'm pretty sure I've said it online, but 
You know, if you if you think this is the soul trap, if you think that you're not in control of your life, then how are you doing anything besides being a slave? Meaning, if we are all slaves and they are all ma- and, and and there's a, a set of masters uh, that are cracking the whip, why are we not all enslaved all the time? Like, how how do you have any free will? That's not how the system works. You never heard about. Well, you can be a slave if you want to. Just stay in the plantation and work, or you can be a slave at your job. Just stay and work for free. That's not how it works. If we're being controlled and manipulated, I guess manipulated is a bad word because you can be manipulated without being controlled. But you, you know what I'm saying? Like it's it, it, we have we have too many joys and too many freedoms to say that we are slaves in this trap. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about it the other day, and um. For those people who believe that life is a soul trap or, you know, life is all about the higher ups controlling us. I mean, we see on the medium, look, fear sells. And that's why we see so many videos, so many news stories that are fearful in nature because human nature is to want to know about those things rather than the good things. And it's all about money as well. It comes down to money. Fearful stories uh, capture attention, and that creates that creates monetary reward, money, for those people that post it. So we see like 95% of the stories out there are probably bad, right? Evil, uh, fearful stuff. And so we were we're so programmed to be to watch TV and the internet, and so our consciousness is being filtered with all of this fearful material instead of realizing that it's probably the other way around in my life, at least none of that stuff happens. None of it. I have a lot of great stuff happening. I'm around good people. I have good events happening. I don't, I don't have tsunamis crashing through my windows and earthquakes. I mean, I, I understand natural disasters happen, but all that stuff, I mean, the more you focus on the negative, the more you attract it into your life. And that's one of the reasons why I like to focus on the positive as much as possible. Yeah, I've had a couple of things happen to me in the past uh, few weeks. There's two in particular that I wanted to bring up as far as this is concerned, because they're cool stories anyway for me. Um, At least I think they're cool stories. So I'm driving on the road on the highway over a bridge going over water. I make this super quick and never seen this happen before, but I actually saw a bird fall out of the sky, hit the pavement and try to get up. So... Pretty, pretty crazy. I don't know if anybody else has ever seen that. Um, so then uh, this is last week that happened to me. This, that was with it about two weeks ago. Uh, I'm walking my dog in the morning, about seven in the morning. And I start thinking about, you know, looking around and thinking, you know, th- if I just look for some signs, I'll find one, you know, of, of which direction to go. And let me show you what I found that fell out of the sky. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes I do see some crazy things in the sky. Like, I don't know very colorful birds flying. And I'm sure that there are colorful birds, but it's always an anomaly, it seems. What is so that? Have you ever seen a feather? feather fall out of the sky? No. Feather fell right out of the sky, right? Probably, I don't know, 10 feet from me. I'm like, what in the world is that? I picked it up and I saw a bird feather. And I'm like, that's that's pretty crazy. That, that thing just fell out of the sky. And I just saw that bird hit the pavement on the highway falling out of the sky a couple weeks ago. I was like, this is insane. Like... I don't know if anybody's ever seen a bird hit the pavement. Like, what the hell just happened? Yeah, I, I don't know what would cause that. Maybe another bird attacked it. Something happened. But, yeah, it definitely seems to be a sign from the universe. Yeah, there's signs all around us. So hopefully we can uh, help change our realities. Hopefully this conversation helped people open their reality a little bit. And, and, and like Tom said, we are one. So appreciate that. Um, Chad, thank you very much. Uh, for for the conversation, it's been a long time coming. Maybe the next time we can talk about the Darius Wright interview. I have some some thoughts on that as well. It seems to be the the twelve realms, the twelve um, things down and below. And I definitely have some comments that we talked about offline about the um, the gravitational horizontal planes of the planets and everything, but nothing's below us or above us. Uh, seems to be rotating. That's kind of odd in itself. So. Yeah, I just want to say that I wrote to Darius a couple of days ago. I heard back from him this morning, and uh, he said he's going to wait till December to come back on the show. But he said just 
round up all the questions and I'll address them in December. So unfortunately, his email, his email is on his website. What's that? His email is on his website. Is that where you got it from? He I, he originally emailed me. Oh wow, cool. I I did not contact him. He contacted me hmm. to be on the show. Nice. So I, I, I'm gonna have to get that from you and see if I can if I can email him. Maybe we can all have a conversation. Just a little less informal. Maybe that's what he wants to do. I don't know. Maybe he'll say no, but uh, I'd like to talk to him too. Well, he was on Open Your Reality and I wanted him to be on Ben the Spoon, but that's fine. You know, you got to respect everybody's decision, but I'll, I'll give you his address and you can see maybe we can get him on uh, your show. Cool. Awesome. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. If you like this, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell and uh, share this conversation. If you have anything to uh, to offer, hit it in the comments and the notes and we will be back to you. Hopefully it won't take me another six weeks to come back. Yeah, um, guys. Thank you for watching all the way to it. the end. We, we appreciate it. Yep. Check out Ben the Spoon, open your reality, and uh, we'll see you in the next side. Peace. Surrender, seek truth, and let go.